really it's really great to have to have Professor George Coghill um, coming to speak to us today. Um, George, just a number of you. George is a regular at these events, but but for many of you who who've just come in for today, um, George is, is professor emeritus professor in computing science at the University of Aberdeen, um, and but he's also a he was he's also currently um, actually studying for a master's in theology at the University of Edinburgh. Um, and like the subject of this talk, he's a, a man of many parts. Besides being a musician, he's also a, a philosopher in his own right, or he's studying phil philosoph philosophical theology. Um, and his talk today is about Donald McCrimmon Mackay, scientist and accidental philosopher. And we'll, the talk will be uh, um, approximately 35 minutes, and then we'll have, hope to have plenty of time for questions afterwards. So thanks very much, George. And, and over to you. I can see your screen. It seems to be sharing successfully. Great. Thanks very much, Ralph. So yes, uh, the title um, scientist and accidental philosopher really highlights something I only realized quite recently is the extent to which Donald Mackay was first and foremost a scientist and his philosophical and theological perspectives or ideas arose from his scientific thinking and experiments. So the word accidental pivots on two things, uh, an ambiguity that accidental just means he stumbled into philosophy and uh, it wasn't central. It's not the main substance of his research, though it is the aspect that I am most interested in, most interested in or totally interested in. Um, my interest in him goes way back. Um, I first came across his writings, a book called The Clockwork Image, which was published in 1974. I got it as a prize uh, at a free church youth camp. I wish I could say it was for something intellectual, but we actually won it, I dorm won it for doing a, a skit on Star Trek in, in the final night. You got to pick something from the um, uh, bookstall and I picked this one. He and from there on, I was I became interested in his ideas. He spoke when I was a first year at uh, Aberdeen Uni at the uh, at the CU. Uh, he and Malcolm Jeeves were up for some for a a, a week of events, uh, and I was fascinated by his ideas then, to the extent that I actually applied to do a PhD with him uh, at Keel just when he had retired and wasn't taking on any more PhD students, which was actually quite providential because when I said to him, the thing that most interested me was his philosophical ideas. He retorted that you wouldn't be doing any of that here. And, um, from my subsequent experience in medical physics, I realized that really I was not cut out to be a neuroscientist anyway. So I went the opposite direction from him and ended up in artificial intelligence. So, Donald McCrimmon Mackay, he was born uh, in Leibster in Caithness. He grew up, uh, spent most of his childhood in, in Wick. Um, and he was always interested in science. His interest in science developed as a teenager. Uh, when he was in the 1930s, uh, working there where radio was becoming more of a, a thing and people were buying radios and they had these um, uh, hair aerials that and, and they were fairly flaky so with his interest in uh, uh, physics and electronics he actually set up a little workshop repairing uh, friends uh, radios when they didn't work and to the extent that he actually turned it into a little business and was able to help the uh, family finances uh, during that time his skill with uh, electronics was manifest in that a wartime colleague had actually said that he must have been born holding a soldering iron. But he was very much uh, an academic. Um, he got the ducks of Wick High School. Then he went on to St Andrews University to study physics with a speciality in, in, in electronics, which was very providential in its own right, because when he went to university, it was 1940, and well, the war, Second World War was on. The four year honours degree was compressed into three years and he won various prizes uh, for the maths and physics and was headhunted by the Admiralty Research Establishment. Uh, they were going around the country looking for the top uh, students in physics to, to, to work on things, what in his case, what eventually became uh, 
uh, radar, and he went to work there. Um, whilst a student, he did have an impish, uh, well, sense of humour is perhaps not the best way of putting it, because he could, um, it wasn't a practical joke, but if somebody annoyed him, he could take action. So there was a student in the halls who had just got a radio and kept playing, I think, jazz rather loudly, which really disturbed Donald's studying, and he didn't like it. So he devised a little uh, uh, device, which whenever the person started um, uh, playing it, he would invoke this device, which created some noise on the channel. And so the guy couldn't listen to his music. He approached Donald to... Uh, uh, help him since he thought there was something wrong with his radio. So Donald went, so couldn't find what was wrong and just have to uh, put up with it, I'm afraid. I don't know what's going on here. <laughs> Eventually the guy stopped playing the radio. Um, but he was very much um, at the top of his game. He went to work in the Admiralty, worked on radar, which set the, the tone of his um, career. He became involved in uh, information theory and control theory and communication, which is what you needed for radar and, and, and these kind of devices at the time. And so when the war finished, he got a, war, a, a job at King's College London, um, where he taught physics, but continued to work on uh, computing. And particularly, he was working on analog computing. He always saw himself as what he would call an analog man. He never bought into the idea that computing or thinking or the brain was anything uh, digital, though he did think it was um, probably a uh, 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 com combination of the two. Um, now, I'm talking about his life. He wasn't particularly interested in people uh, talking about his life. He was much more interested that uh, that people should consider his ideas and explore those further. Um, so I think um, there is a lot still to be done on Donald Mackay's life. I'm not going to go into very much more. I'll, I'll speak about it as I go through with regard to his ideas, mainly because I'm not an historian. Uh, and whilst I like reading history of science, I'm not uh, skilled or interested in actually doing it. But while he was working at the Admiralty Research Institute uh, establishment and whilst his early times in King's, some of his experiments were on very high frequency pulsed electronic signals. And one of the things he discovered was that these, these experiments led to him finding some things which were seen could not be reconciled together into a single entity, but they seem to form complementary pairs, which got him thinking about uh, complementarity. And when he went to work in Kings, uh, he had spoke to someone, told him that what he thought he had found was something he could call a quanta of information. And this person then put him on to uh, the ideas of Ludwig Wittgenstein and the Tractatus. Uh, and then he started speaking to some philosophers who pointed him in various directions. Now, what's interesting about that is that while he was a student, one of the things Donald Mackay asked was, what exactly is the point of philosophy? He was so wedded to science that he really could not see any point to it. Um, but that gradually changed as he became more involved in uh, science proper and doing his own experiments and having to think through uh, the various issues associated with them. So as he developed his ideas, um, he, 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 he focused on, first of all, information theory. What was information? How was information communicated? Uh, how could we understand meaning? Uh, and all these kinds of things. Now, he is attributed with saying information is a distinction that makes a difference as a definition. The first time I came across this was uh, uh, a professor of computing science in 1986 called Keith van Rijsbergen at Glasgow University, um, quoting Mackay. He referred it to his book, The Information Mechanism and Meaning. Luciano Floridi, in his book, The Philosophy of Information, which was published in 2011, also attributes this definition to Mackay. 
The problem is I have searched all through information mechanism and meaning and I cannot find anywhere that he actually says it. I've done a Google search and no, the only thing I've, that's come up is other people asking the same question. Where did Mackay actually say this? I've asked his widow. She can't point me into the right direction, which is rather unfortunate because it's a rather, uh, I think it's a rather good definition of information uh, because it gives information. A good on, have we lost oh he's a standpoint or per, sorry sorry we lost you for about 20 seconds there george you froze oh, oh. sorry um what was the last thing i said um, <laughs> it was just after you just just after you'd said that that you'd failed to trace uh, the, the 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 quotation about information being a distinction oh, right, okay. difference being it's unfortunate that you couldn't trace it because it's a very nice definition i yes, think that was about yes. when you froze OK, well, the, 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 all I said after that was that it, it, it forms a contrast uh, or complement to the colloquial uh, definition of uninformativeness, a distinction that makes no difference. Um, so these two things can go together to form the, the, the spectrum of information. Um, his uh, developments of electronics and uh, analog computing and the discovery of these complementary relationships made him realize that standpoint or perspective uh, is of fundamental importance and that's underpinned his thinking from then on. So uh, it's put succinctly not in a different context but in a more recent context by Luciano Floridi again do not ask absolute questions for they just create an absolute mess. Uh, Floridi's levels of abstraction seem to me to fit very well with what we'll talk about with Don Mackay's versions of uh, what he called complementarity. But he did say he knew of no procedure for infallibly identifying the logical standpoint, whatever that is, but that there is a general idea of difference of standpoint, and that's clear enough. Uh, and that therefore we can talk about things as being complementary. So for something, for two things or two or more things to be complementary, they have a common reference. They're talking about the same thing. Each is in principle exhaustive. So that means that within the language or within the perspective or standpoint from which they uh, uh, are looking at the, 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 the reference, they are complete. The, they, they cover all the bases in that regard, but they don't necessarily account for things from another perspective. Um, and therefore, they make different assertions because the logical preconditions of the definition of use, the context of the context or relationships are mutually exclusive. So that is. You don't mix the two perspectives of the complementary uh, aspects do not mix and therefore things are omitted from one that would appear as 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 part of the other. Now, he 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 recognized that there's different ways you can look at um complementarity both hierarchic and non-hierarchic a non-hierarchic example was what he would have in a in, in, in a space so if you have uh two points p and q and they both have the coordinates x1 and x uh, y1 um the question arises is that a contradiction and the answer is that depends. If it's a two dimensional space, then yes, there's a contradiction. But if it's not a two dimensional space, then it might well be that there's three dimensions and the first two dimensions are, 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 are the same, but the Z axis is different. Uh, it does require that the projection, if you have a 3D object, you project onto all the points onto the two dimensional uh, space, in which case you have three possibilities of projection X, Y, uh, y, Z and X, Z. All of them will be complementary. There's information missing or unobtainable uh, from the X, Y, but it will be visible in the X, Z, for example. It's the relationships that are uh, lost. Hierarchic uh, 
complementarity he discovered or thought was that information is an embodied thing. So when you're communicating things, you you do it in a um, in a communication channel or a communication system. So examples he would give are of something that is written down. So in this case, we've got here something called he's taken the set, which is a proposition or a statement. It could be uh, Andy Murray winning uh, a set at tennis, um, becoming less likely these days, but it, that might be, be the case. Now, in that case, we don't have any problem in understanding what's going on there. We can see it, we can read it, and it makes sense to us. But he uh, would point out that there are two things there. There's a set of pixels on the screen, I could remove quite a lot of these pixels and it wouldn't make any difference. You'd still be able to read the message. You could remove all the internal pixels and only leave the outline and the message would remain the same. Uh, and so the these two things are complement, complementary. So a physicist or a chemist or a computer, computer engineer could give a complete specification of the geometric distribution of all the pixels on that screen and say absolutely nothing about the message that is contained therein. And the language of engineering or physics or chemistry, the message would be irrelevant. It would be so the, the, the description of the physics or the chemistry or the geometry of that would be complete with regard to that particular domain. On the other hand, a linguist or logician or a literary person could read that and see the message, say what the message means without any reference to the underlying geometry or physics or whatever. So these two things form a hierarchical uh, complementary relationship, which for Mackay means that the linguistic or the logical or the um, uh, uh, meaningful part, semantic part, sits on top of and is 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 the the higher level uh, version. And the reason he says that is you can remove a lot of the pixels, as I said, and make no difference to the message. It remains the same. So you can adapt or adjust. So you can change things at the lower level without changing things at the higher level. But if you change the meaning, so if you change that or he's taken the he's taken the bet, um, you've changed some of the pixels. The, ge the geometry has been disturbed. So his 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 uh, uh, view was that it's higher level because you cannot change the meaning of that sentence without also changing the physical or geometric distribution of the pixels on the screen. Now, he applied that, the heading up there is nothing buttery. When he was writing about this in the middle of the 20th century, um, there were views uh, associated with people like Clarence Darrow or Jacques Monod that the brain or the physical representation of a human, the physiological aspects, were all there was. And the, the what we called the mind or what was information or whatever was simply a manifestation of the physics of the system. So that once you had identified everything in the brain, there was nothing else to talk about. The person was nothing but their brain physiology, which um, Mackay referred to as nothing buttery. Uh, and of course, through complementarity and his view of how information and energy or physics were related, he found the Monod's views to be uh, not particularly appealing nor compelling. Now, um, one of the, the other things he would say in that regard is we can then talk about um, duality without dualism. So he, he didn't see dualism as being incoherent, so Popper and Eccles view that there is a, a, another world which interacts with the physical world. Uh, he just didn't see it as necessary because all the information, everything you needed was captured through this notion of complementarity. So there is a correlation identified here uh, between the I story, which is our internal subjective story. We talk about I feel, I see, I hear, I think, I believe. And an O story, the observer story, something a physiologist could look at in the brain and they would observe it using instrumentation. Uh, they could see a neural activity A would be associated, correlated with 
I feel activity B correlated with I C. Now, he very strongly avoided using uh, causal terms for the interactions between these levels. He just said they're very strongly correlated. Uh, they relate and you can identify the two things. Could be a one to one correlation, but not necessarily. So I believe of highlight. I'll come back to this one um, later. I believe can be associated with uh, uh, you know, some other neural activity. So we may see, say I feel sick or I feel uh, uh, happy. Now he is not saying, in fact, he quite clearly uh, denies that that means that that you are happy or that you are sick. It's just that you would be lying to deny that that is the way you feel. It's not an objective, it's a purely subjective thing in that regard. The objective part is the observer's story on the uh, activity. Um, now, in that regard, there is something else that needs to be said. I chose that example of he's taken the set deliberately because this is one that I think Mackay is not quite right here. Um, as he presents it, it'd be hard to distinguish his view of complementarity from that of supervenience, which it does actually seem to match with. But there is a point here in that the word set is the most ambiguous word in the English language. It's it, the verb has um, 430 separate meanings. It takes up about 60,000 words in the Oxford English Dictionary uh, in terms of all the definitions. So he's taken the set objectively could mean and a tennis match, as I mentioned, but it could also be an antique dealer selling uh, a set of plates or a set of chessmen to someone else and passing on the information he's taken the set. And if he was an aficionado uh, of tennis as well as a um, uh, uh, secondhand uh, antique dealer, um, the two you can switch from the one to the other without actually changing the underlying geometry of the the the, the uh, message of the physics. Uh, so from that point of view, complementarity, whilst it can still be seen as a hierarchical uh, thing, does not quite match in, in, in every aspect uh, what Mackay wanted it to say. Actually, I think that's actually quite good because it makes it slightly more general than a straightforward uh, approach of supervenience. So he he started off an information theory and he moved on as he worked in King's College. He started to look at could um, could artifacts, informational artifacts uh, perform uh, intelligent tasks. And he did his PhD in, in analog computing at ultra high speed uh, was what he called it. But he did develop some rudimentary AI uh, analog devices. In fact, the first device was one of the earliest machine learning devices back in the 1940s. He developed an analog uh, computer that would take data in and adjust its behavior according to how something was moving so that it could maintain uh, a target, uh, dropping balls on a particular target. It was very rudimentary, but it was a very early machine learning system. And the current uh, trend to focus things on deep learning can trace its roots back to that kind of approach, that analog approach. Um, he did say that some kind of hybrid system was probably the way forward. Uh, and he was a British represent, representative at the Dartmouth Conference. Now, the Dartmouth Conference was in 1956, which is where the name AI was uh, was coined by John McCarthy. He persuaded people that that was the best way to go. There were delegates from all over the world, experts and researchers in artificial intelligence, and Mackay was one of them. Um, in doing this, he, he, he started then thinking about uh, how mind and body were complementary in the ways that we uh, kind of spoken of. Um, but uh, because of his views of complementarity, he would not have agreed that there's nothing more to the mind than simply uh, the brain. It's persons that think, not brains. And so when he spoke about AI, he, he had no problem, um, even though he was uh, a Christian, uh, with the idea that we could create in principle, he didn't think it would ever happen in practice, uh, uh, um, an intelligent agent. 
but he did think that rule following, which was the the, the digital approach, and uh, in the 1980s, just before he died, expert systems were the big thing, but they didn't have any stochastic. The original expert systems were purely formal, logical systems. They did they lacked uncertainty reasoning. That all changed uh, in the mid 80s when Bayesian methods and others uh, come into play. Um, so he saw rule following as being inadequate, but stochastic principles could remedy its deficiencies. And he saw the, the, the stochastic aspect as being the analog uh, part of the hybrid computer. Um, the last sentence there, whether these requirements can be met in anything other than biological material is an open question. Now, up to now, we've all been all AI and all computing has been developed in, in silico. Uh, you might say, but there is now, uh, and very recently, uh, last year, there were some papers written on de uh, people developing, growing real neurons and interfacing those to input output devices to actually carry out computational uh, tasks. So 40 odd years on or 50 years on from when Mackay was writing this, that is actually the way things are, are, are starting to go, at least in rudimentary form. So, yeah, I've already say, said that he saw uh, the creation of an artificial entity as being not creative, but procreative uh, in a parallel with the way we procreate ourselves uh, at each new generation. He didn't see any difference in principle by using uh, artificially begetting, as he called it, a conscious agent. He didn't think and there are outside science fiction notwithstanding uh, uh, some fears about the singularity, I don't think we're any closer to, and I personally don't think we will ever actually reach that point, but that's 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 a practical, not a theoretical issue. <clears throat> so complementarity and this idea of standpoint underpinned all his thinking. As he went on uh, developing things, by the late 1940s, he was moving away from uh, thinking purely in artificial information theory terms, and his view was, well, if I'm going to write, about, study something, why and, and and think about intelligence, it's probably better to study the one thing we know that exhibits intelligence, which is the human brain or human mind. And so he gradually started moving from uh, information theory to artificial intelligence to neuroscience, and got a scholarship to go to America, went around various neuroscience labs, was involved in the MIT neuroscience um, uh, lab for most of his career after that, and then just focused on being a neuroscientist. And then starting thinking about the brain in the, the early 50s. So he was part of a group called the Ratio Club, which involved himself, uh, Gray Walter, Alan Turing and some others. I think Karl Popper may have gone along occasionally, but Karl Popper started a philosophy of science reading group, which Mackay also attended. Now, in early 1950s, Popper wrote a seminal paper called Indeterminism in Classical and Quantum Physics. Um, that got Mackay thinking. And one of the things he came up with was considering what would happen if you uh, started to um, look at your own brain. Uh, and then that has issues for freedom. So his focus then became on uh, how, if determinism were correct, would we be free? So he doesn't commit to determinism, but he does say, what is the, what is the situation if that were the case? Uh, and he's thinking is in the context of stuff that Popper has said. So what do <clears throat> the first question you have to ask is, what does it mean for someone to be free? So. He starts off by saying, well, you could say it means you can't nobody could predict what someone is going to be going to do. It's random. It's fully stochastic. There's no way of there's there are no scientific ways of making such a prediction. And he calls that freedom of caprice. Now, cap Capriciousness is not seen as a good thing, and this is actually something that is generally accepted. That this is that kind of indeterminism is not really a very good way of um, protecting 
uh, human freedom. The version he goes with is that it's, it's a person is free if the decision is up to them, in the sense that until they make that decision, it is not, it won't be made, and that there's no fully determined specification that would allow someone to say to a person, this is what you will do. And that is, they could falsify it if they were told it. Now, he he, he arrives at that position. Um, sorry. Yeah, so he th th that description uh, sets the context. So we can look at freedom of choice or freedom of action uh, as having four components. The outcome of the decision is up to them. So straightforwardly, unless they make the decision, it won't be made. They're actually in a position to make that decision. They have the options. And there's no fully determinate specification of the outcome that already exists, which they would be correct to accept as inevitable. That is the key one that we'll go on to look at. And they would be able to falsify it if only they knew it, able to falsify it. Uh, I've highlighted that because there is a there is an issue that does come up. So a determinate uh, specification, that is, is, is one of the interesting ones uh, that we need to uh, think about. Now, This is where people get lost. Uh, this is what Mackay said. He, this has always been the thing that it does look like sleight of hand. But what he, he, he did, sorry. Five minutes, just as, okay. as promised. Thanks. Right. So in looking at things, he, did, he, he identified the cognitive mechanism. So the cognitive mechanism in the brain, kind of skills, things you can do, norms, the beliefs that you have of, of that are uh, identified context of thinking and maps, the beliefs that you have and your thinking, your knowledge and the information and the reasoning that you do. Um, so focusing on maps, he said, right, what happens then if you have this thing he called a cerebroscope? And he goes on and relates it to if you turn a camera uh, onto the screen that you, you've got a camera taking an image and displaying it on a screen. If you turn the camera on the screen, the screen just goes fuzzy. It's absolutely impossible to get any st stable picture of what's going on. It's just going to add in for nine And that's what he realized would happen if if you turn try to turn on a, uh, the cerebroscope to look at the brain. You would not be able to get a complete picture. No person can have complete knowledge of their own brain brain or their own beliefs. It's just impossible. That I think is uh, incontrovertible. Uh, however, somebody else looking at you could uh, get that picture. So as long as you don't know it, somebody else can look at your brain uh, and see exactly a super scientist, the, this observer gets every detail of it. So we're talk this is never going to really happen, but it's a, a thought experiment that he came up with. So the observer has this picture of your brain in their own uh, uh, domain. Now, the, he then said, the present and immediately future state of your brain, however predictable for an attached observer, has no completely determinate specification that you would be unconditionally, and I don't know why, this is what's given me big problems. He, he uses this word unconditionally correct to accept and the nerd to reject when he knew it. And it would be therefore inevitable for you. And again, he talks about there's no completely up to date predictive specification with an unconditional claim to the ascent. Now, um, that's what caused me problems um, because his idea then was that if you have A has a particular cognitive mechanism, that's the, 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 the beliefs, the maps that they have, as long as there's no interference with A, you can make an accurate prediction. He says, let's assume determinism is correct. He's not, he's not saying it necessarily is, but the worst case scenario, determinism is absolutely correct. Does that mean people aren't free? And his argument is, no, it doesn't mean that because of this uh, feedback loop. You cannot, if you told the person what they were going to do and they could say to you, okay, you think I'm, I'm, I'm determinate, tell me what I'm going to do. And it just can't be done. Uh, it would be valid for the person observing as long as they don't interfere with the system. Physical world, he said, was different in that you could make universally valid claims. Now, I'm not going to go into why that, how that can be falsified, which it can. It's not as clear cut as he makes out. But the key point there is that there are very few things 
in the world that have an unconditional claim to anyone's assent. Tautologies necessary being might be the, the about the only two things there is. So I think he is guilty of what's called the modal fallacy. Uh, it goes back at least to Aquinas. And it's the difference between the necessity of the consequent and the necessity of the consequence. And to confuse those things, it still appears in modal logic textbooks. People do mix it up. So if you've got a statement like if you're in brain state B, you will inevitably perform action A. This is what the observer can say. If you are if observed this brain state, I know what the, I have the model of the brain absolutely. And I can predict like in any other system how it's going to behave over the next uh, n seconds and therefore I know what action is going to be performed. Now, how do you parse that? There's two ways you can parse it. And the common way would be to think, if you're in brain state B, then this box means it is, an, it is, it is inevitably the case that, or it is uh, necessarily the case that A. In which case you observe the brain state being in B, so it is inevitably the case. Now, in terms of possible worlds, which is the common way of dealing with modal logic, that says that if in you're in brain state B in one world, and then in every world you're going to contain uh, action A. That is not even the, the the correct way of parsing that according to modal logic is to say that if you're in brain state B, you will inevitably perform action A. Should more correctly be said, inevitably, or it is always going to be the case that if you're in brain state B, you will perform action A. That's a different thing. So his relative his relativity of his logical relativity at this point fails because this is true for everyone, including the observer. The fact they don't know or can't know what their brain state is, is irrelevant. That statement would be correct for them. And therefore, if they were in brain state B, they could agree. Yes, I will perform action A, which goes against what Mackay was trying to get across. Unfortunately, there is no unconditional claim for anyone on this. For the observer who doesn't tell the subject what they're going to do, they can predict it, but it's not an unconditional claim. It's a conditional claim because it's conditioned on them actually observing brain state B. Uh, that's just uh, a fuller version of the uh, modal version. Now, great thing about fallacies is that just because something is fallacious doesn't mean the conclusion is false. It just means that something is wrong with the argument. So we could actually re review it. Uh, so to outline it, I will say that for the observer, if you divide this up into particular worlds, a, a multi-world view, a modal logical view, a modal solution, for the observer, A, the prediction that uh, they will do this action is true in the only possible world that the, wor the observer is willing to countenance at that time, which is where there's no communication. On the other hand, for the subject, if they, from their perspective still, from their world, which is a different world to the world of the observer, B is not defined because it just can't be for them. There is, it doesn't exist. That, that, I think, is incontrovertible. So as long as that is the case, both A and not A, whatever the action is, you can either do the action or not do the action. And put it in possibility terms, the diamond just means it is possible that A. Both of these are uh, 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 the case. It could be both possibly A and it could be possibly not A. So until they make up their mind, both of the, the future is actually open for them. Now, what is puzzling to me is that this, whilst it, did, it, it does look like sleight of hand and the way Mackay presented it, I think, was flawed, but it's been ignored since he died. Now, it's one thing to criticise things. It's another thing to ignore them. And I don't understand why it's been ignored, because it is given all that's been done in determinism and free will uh, since 1975. There's been a raft of stuff published since uh, Peter van Imogen wrote his paper about the incompatibility of determinism and free will. Uh, there's been lots of responses, just couldn't cover it all. Um, no one has mentioned uh, Mackay's work. And I think there is uh, value in it. And I think it does actually work just by a, a slight bit of rejigging, as I've done here. Hey, how, George, is that me? Should at, I finish there? Time, but I'm wondering, I mean, because because the description of the of the talk, you can see where you're heading as well. There's clearly just really important and fascinating implications of, of these of this thinking for for Mackay's views on um, on on 
the god of the gaps and 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 yeah. the, the nature of, of predestination and things like that i wonder if would you be able to take a, a one more minute just to very really very briefly to enable time for questions to sort of to sure. say something about okay. the implications so yeah so what mackay would say from this and from a theological viewpoint is that this uh, recognition that you cannot predict or tell a person what they're going to do without interfering with them because that's uh, that state does not exist for them that is also true for God and his implications for predestination now for Mackay with his upbringing he grew up in the free church he grew up as a reformed Calvinist that was a view that he held he, he actually in, in some of his writings he is very clear uh, that there is no necessity to shy away from uh, uh, the the full double predestination that God predestines some to heaven, some to hell, because it doesn't actually undermine free will for the reasons that he gives here. His logical indeterminism and logical relativity means that man is still free and makes free choices in accordance with uh, logical indeterminism. And he he doesn't feel that it does any good to um, God or anyone else to attribute logical nonsense, what he would consider logical nonsense to God or to anyone. Uh, yes, I should have said something about God of the gaps. I missed out that slide because I was cutting things down. Mackay had a, a lifelong dislike for anything that's that 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 um, uh, smelt of God of the gaps because, as far as he was concerned. Theology and science formed complementary, not complementary, uh, a relationship. So even from the point of view of creation, he sees creation as a God, as author, doing a complete rewrite of the story after the fall. He doesn't see Genesis 1 and 2 as being the key parts. Uh, he sees that uh, the fall in Genesis 3 was the key uh, part and God completely rewrites it, which is why, from his point of view, evolutionary theory and theological descriptions of how things are form are not in any way in conflict. And miracles, you can quite easily have from his the complementary perspective of something like the the miracle of turning water into wine. The master of the feast, no matter how much science he applied to it, could not come up with anything other than a a, a, a scientific view that. This wine started off life as a grape, and that is a perfectly acceptable uh, viewpoint in Mackay's perspective. The servants knew what had happened, the master of the feast didn't. And so when you're looking at it from this perspective, you're going to see something different from what uh, you would see from uh, a, a revelatory perspective. But he also has the idea of coupled agents. So God in dialogue, so he talks about agents in dialogue, they form a single system. And the rules of uh, the the cerebroscope would apply to that as a, this as a whole system. Neither person involved in this dialogue can have a complete picture of what is going on within the dialogue. And in terms of uh, any dialogical world where you've got the people in dialogue, a third party outside the uh, uh, the, the system can, as with the super observer on the single case can have a complete picture of what's going on in here. The people inside it can't. Mackay applies that not to, to prove that there is a God, but if there is a God, then they must be multipersonal. Because if incarnation happened and God, as he calls it, God in dialogue, cannot be the same person as the person who is looking on and keeping control of the whole thing, simply because the God in dialogue would no more be able to have a complete omniscient view of, of the system of which they were a part uh, than any other person would. Uh, now, this is in Trinitarian terms, this is just dealing with what would be called the, the, the economic or functional trinity. It doesn't. And you could go further, uh, which I am thinking of doing uh, and express that and how that would that would um, apply to the ontological trinity, what they are in themselves. Uh, and if it is true that a person cannot have complete knowledge of themselves logically, then that has implications for 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 the the persons of of the Trinitarian God. But this 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 is where Mackay left it. Now, one of the things about Mackay, and this is where I couldn't quite understand this for 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 for, for many months, was 
the reason he never developed, he threw out these ideas, he defended those ideas, but he never developed those ideas, never took them forward to, to see where they would lead. And the reason for that is that he was first and foremost a scientist. These things, these things rose out of his science. He thought about them as they had risen out of them. And once he had convinced himself that, yeah, this, this works, I leave it at that. And he then spent 40 years defending them, but not developing them. He was always going back to his science. And even in the end of his life, he was looking at things from a scientific point of view. Roger Sperry got the Nobel Prize for his work on uh, cutting the corpus callosum and ending up with what he called two, two persons in the box. So the, the corpus callosum device is you end up with a divided brain, which is what he, he, he talked about. Mackay and his wife, who was also a physicist, neurophysiologist, did various experiments in that to show that there were not two personalities. Yes, you could put the left and the right hand brain in competition, but only so far. Eventually, a hierarchical ordering organization would kick in and they would actually reconcile. Because, of course, although you cut the corpus callosum, there are other communication channels in the nervous system. Now, I'm ending where I began with this quote from uh, J.W. Haas Jr. And the reason is, I would like to see, uh, I'm, I'm focused on the philosoph philosophical side, but I think there is a lot of work or there's some good work that could be done if someone was a historian of science was interested in taking it up to look at his life uh, as a scientist, somebody in the middle of the 20th century who did uh, work on information theory, artificial intelligence and neuroscience. He won prizes he, towards the end of his life. He gave the Gifford lectures. He was also awarded the Humboldt Humboldt Prize for uh, contributions, international contributions to neuroscience. So quite an eminent uh, scientist. Um, the one mystery to me, I'll end, I'll end with this sentence. I cannot understand and I've not been able to find out why it didn't happen, but he never was a fellow of the Royal Society, which for somebody in his position and eminence, just I, I just can't get my head around why that never happened. Anyway, so, sorry for going on so long, but uh, uh, Hopefully that's given you some insight into to, 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 to Donald Mackay. No, thank you very much. It's, it's a really fascinating figure and thanks for explaining so clearly some of these, for me at least as a non-philosopher, some pretty complex and difficult um, concepts uh, earlier on, which really sets the, makes sense of what you're saying later about his theological views. 